Thank you, thank you very much. I want to start this talk uh, with a little warning, uh, which is simply that hackers are uh, everywhere. Uh, you know who I mean. It's people like this, uh, destroying, uh, hacking into your, your applications, your users' accounts, um, clearly wearing gloves so he doesn't get his fingerprints on his keyboard, I guess. Uh, and the balaclava is important, of course. It's people like this woman who is such a good hacker. She's managed to find herself a laptop in jail. It's people like this guy who, even though he's in a darkened room, needs those uh, sunglasses on to look extra cool. And I don't know what he's doing. I don't know how he's hacking it. But whatever he is doing, it's working because there is money pouring out of that keyboard. <sighs> so my name's Son Ash. Uh, I am a developer evangelist at a company called Twilio. Uh, can I ask um, who here has heard of Twilio at all before? Okay, a few of you. Cool, cool. So for any of you who haven't, um, Twilio is a, a communications API. So it's a platform that you can use in your applications to do things like send and receive text messages, make or receive phone calls, and any kind of communication thing you can dream of, you can build uh, using Twilio. Um, if you want to find out more about that, uh, we have been hanging around uh, as one of the little sponsor booths uh, for the conference. Uh, we'll still be here at the end, and we've got a, you know, we've got a few bits of swag still left over if you want to swing by for stickers or... Or uh, we have a couple of t-shirts hiding under the table, if, if that's what you're interested in. So come by and, uh, and, and, and talk to us. But I'm not here to talk about uh, Twilio today. I'm here to talk about two-factor authentication and finding out uh, WTF it is. So let's start with part one, the horrifying reality of password security. Oh boy, I love talking about other people's passwords. But I'm going to start by talking about my own. Uh, I remember this is. I remember my first password. I don't know if you remember your first one, but I remember mine. It's because it was terrible. Um, I, I had to set a password on my user account on my school computer uh, back when I think I, I must have been twelve. Uh, it's when Mac OS looked like this, um, and uh, and as a, a super smart twelve-year-old into the idea of security, I picked uh, my lo my last name in lowercase letters as my password. <laughs> That's right, a classic four-character password. <sighs> my friends were not particularly technically uh, uh, able, but they were able to hack into my account, funnily enough. So um, that taught me a very early lesson about uh, uh, passwords. I say it taught me an early lesson. Uh, my second password was still only four characters, so I clearly didn't learn at that point. But nobody got into that one. <sighs> so I was hacked. I was hacked by my friends. My friends did not look like this, uh, which is fine. It's probably for the best. But I want to tell you a story about a guy who really got hacked. And um, this is incredible. So this is Matt Honan. He's a journalist. He used to work for Wired magazine. And uh, it was a quite a while ago now, but he has an incredible story of how his uh, digital life was kind of destroyed by a couple of people online. And I'll tell you why they did later. You see, Matt lost access to everything. And this is how they did it. The thing, the thing was, because he was a journalist, he, uh, he decided after the uh, hacking that he'd go and contact his hackers and find out how they did it. So this is what they did. They found his Gmail address on his personal site, right? So on his, uh, on his own web page, he had his email address. That seems reasonable. So they went to Gmail and plugged it in and found out he had a, a, a me.com account as a backup email address uh, where the password would be, re would be reset to. So they went, all right, cool. Next thing they did was call up Amazon to add a credit card to uh, Matt's file. That seems kind of nice of them. Why would they give him a credit card? Um, and it wasn't straightforward. You see, in order to convince Amazon over the phone that uh, they got locked out of their account, but they needed to add this credit card to it, they eventually they had to give them some details. This ultimately boiled down to the person on the phone being like, OK, we need to know your email address and, a, uh, and, your, and, and your address, address that's on your account. And I, so cool. We reckon, I don't think he actually found out this, but we reckon that they found his address out of like a who is record against his domain. That's an easy way to find somebody's address. And so with his email address and his, his home address, they added a credit card to the account. Then they called up again to say, hey, I forgot my password. And of course, uh, Amazon support have to go through a bunch of things at this point uh, to, to try and find out if it's really him uh, trying to change or reset his password. Uh, and um, and uh, eventually it boiled down to three things that they needed to get out of that. They needed an email address, they needed the billing address, and they needed the last four digits of a credit card that were on file. So whatever credit card they added before, they were able to tell those last four digits. So they got into his Amazon account. And at this point, they called up Apple. 
And at this point, they actually could uh, backtrace through the uh, steps of this to find out what time this all happened. So this is where we start to see how things sped up. They called it Apple to reset the password. And they went through the same process, uh, eventually boiling down to Apple support saying, hey, we need an email address, a billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card on file. Now, of course, they couldn't use those four digits of the credit card they'd put on his Amazon file, but inside his Amazon account, he had the other last four digits of credit cards that he used. So they were able to reset his Apple password and get him to his me.com email address. So of course, at that point, they straight up reset. Oh, sorry, yes. So after 17 minutes of convincing uh, that team that they were uh, resetting their Apple password, um, they reset it, got involved, and instantly went on and reset uh, the Gmail account password uh, to that me.com thing, breaking into his email. And you know email's the center of everything anyway. So at 5.01 p.m. that day, they wiped his iPhone from his Apple account, um, and 5.02 reset his Twitter password, and 5.05 wiped his MacBook remotely and deleted his Google account. It's a bit harsh, really. And then at 5.12 p.m., posted on Twitter saying, hey, we did this, we broke into this guy's account. And the really annoying thing was, the only reason they broke into his account is because he had the Twitter account Matt, and that's what they wanted. You see, in, those med uh, in between 10 minutes, they also posted some pretty nasty things on his Twitter account, which wasn't very friendly. Um, but breaking his account like that, breaking everything, uh, was, I think is incredible, because at no point, at no point in, in any of that did they actually use any of his real passwords uh, and break them. They just had to break into various other ways around it. But if at any point during that process a second factor of authentication was going to be required, it would have stopped things dead. So that's what we want to think about as we go through the rest of, of this talk. Um, of course, password security uh, becomes... Uh, it's, it's an interesting um, place because we want to make sure our users have secure passwords. You know, a capital letter, a number, an emoji, a plot, a protagonist, some character development, and a twist at the end. Something like that. But the problem is that making people use stronger passwords, making them uh, pick all of these weird patterns and things, makes passwords harder to remember. And so this leads to, I think, what the biggest problem with password security is uh, in, uh, in the web today, which is simply that people reuse their passwords everywhere. Like, who here has used the same email address and password for more than one account? Yeah, you can, I, I have so many times, far too many times. And we can learn to get over this, but we do reuse them. Um, and the problem with that is not necessarily that, like, that password's insecure or anything, but it's what other websites do with it. And so I like this story. Uh, Ashley Madison is a site which people uh, you know, sign up to so they can cheat on their partners in marriage. Not a great site. Um, there's other reasons to use it as well. But they lost all their user data one time. There's a big breach. And they had hashed their passwords, uh, which was good, except about 11 million of them had been hashed using MD5, which was bad. So a security firm broke uh, the encryption on that and un uh, uh, unhashed 11 million of the passwords. And so what I find <laughs> fun is to think of this site where you're supposed to be doing secret things and keeping it very private. Here's the top five passwords that people used on ashleymadison.com. Uh, in at number five, uh, was uh, 1234567289, nine. a classic password. That's a good nine characters, though, as you can tell from the number of characters. Uh, pretty strong, right? Uh, number four was default in capital letters. This is a weird one. I don't know why this is the case, but uh, um, I guess it was maybe like a, a placeholder text that people just kept submitting. Number three is password, of course. Not even password one, just password on all lowercase letters. Uh, number two, uh, one, two, three, four, five. And in number one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Incredible. <laughs> and in fact, uh, the company uh, who broke into all these passwords like released the, the list and so you could count uh, how many of those were used. And one, two, three, four, five, six was used 120,000 times as a password. <sighs> uh, and there's, there's the, other, the rest of the top 10 there as well. QWERTY, I think, is great. Uh, in at number nine um, was not the letters NSFW. Uh, it's simply that that password was, in fact, not safe for work, and I'm not going to repeat it on stage. <sighs> so people reuse their passwords, and they pick weak passwords, and then applications like this, web applications like this, leak those passwords to the web, and then it becomes incredibly easy as an attacker 
to take those passwords and use them against other sites. And so, um, and this happened, uh, I enjoy this one, uh, to Mark Zuckerberg, in fact, uh, who had not only uh, a hugely secure password of six characters, um, I guess he let his kids set the password, but he'd used this on his Instagram account and his LinkedIn account and, and lost access to both of them one time because password reuse is, is affecting everyone. And it affected me as well. When I said earlier, you know, who's used the same password and account um, uh, across, uh, same email and password across multiple accounts, I'm 100% guilty of this, to the point that I lost access to both my Skype and Spotify uh, accounts one day, on one day. In fact, the day actually started with me um, getting a text message uh, from Dropbox to say, hey, you're trying to log in, here's your, uh, here's your code. And I, I'm, I'm walking down the street, I wasn't trying to log in at all. But I was saved. I was saved by that sex message because I did not lose access to my Dropbox account. Later that day, I lost Skype and Spotify and I got those emails saying, hey, you just updated your password. And I was like, oh, I didn't. <sighs> and I don't know what happened. Uh, I got back. I actually got back into both accounts eventually, which was great. Um, I managed to talk my way. I managed to convince both Skype and Spotify that I was me and I was allowed to go back in. And nothing really had happened with my Spotify account. That was fine. Nobody had like made some sweet playlists for me whilst they had access to my account. Uh, but my Skype account uh, was, uh, was an odd one. Um, they, uh, they didn't change the profile picture. They did change the name, but you can't change the, the actual username. So it's still Phil Nash was the username there. Uh, but they did use the account to, using text chat, uh, proposition a number of men in French for marriage. Um, <laughs> I, I found all these like chat logs when I logged back in and, uh, and some of the men were not against it as well. There was some positive like, oh, maybe, you know, <laughs> which um, worried me so much. I then instantly deleted all of this history because I never wanted to see it again. And I'm only sad about that because I'd love to have shared some of those messages. But um, I was just scared at the point. So I was like, get rid of them all. So my Skype account was, yeah, used for weird French marriage scams, I think not even for the three pounds of credit that was on there. So anyway, um, the reason uh, those accounts got hacked was because I was using that same email address and password, and I used it across you know, some of those compromised sites like Adobe and Yahoo and LinkedIn and Tumblr and MySpace and Dropbox eventually got hacked, and Bitly and Discuss, and I have received ha uh, breach notifications from all of these places because I had an account and they gave up my password sometime. <sighs> so it's not even you know, any old website that might leak people's data. Uh, it is the biggest sites in the world uh, that can do so. As a side point, if you've not heard of haveibeenpwned.com, this is a hugely important service at a personal level. You can put your email address in there and any time your accounts arrive on one of these public breaches, uh, they will let you know that that's happened. Very important service. Uh, and, uh, and we'll certainly uh, warn you to get that password like changed immediately. And the worrying thing is, uh, this, this site picks up breaches every, every week, almost every day, there's a new public breach from somewhere of people's credentials. Uh, there are currently um, more than 700 billion passwords in there. 700 billion? 700 million. 700 million, that seems more likely. Um, so go check that out. Uh, it's, a, it's a useful thing. But now you're probably thinking, okay, cool, I'm a smart developer. I'm going to conferences. I use a password manager to look after my passwords. Um, and I have different ones for every site now. And this is what I do now, of course. I use Bitwarden, which is the one on the uh, right there. Uh, but you might use 1Password or LastPass to make sure you have unique and strong passwords for all of your accounts. And that's cool. I want you to do that. I want everyone to do that. But why I'm talking about this today and why password security is so important to us as developers is that we are responsible for any user of our application and their terrible password policies and their terrible other accounts and other sites. So uh, I wanted to point out, yeah, we have a, there was a study done in the US in 2016 um, to show how Americans keep track of their online passwords. Uh, most of them, 86%, mostly just memorize their passwords. Uh, and 65% will do that most often. Half of Americans will write down their passwords on a piece of paper. Um, and if you can see kind of down the bottom, uh, we've got like 18% save them in their browser and 12% use password managers and two and 3% of that, those use most often. 
I was really surprised actually that people don't save them in their browser that more often. That's, that seems an easy thing to do. It pops up every time you fill in a password. Like, do you want me to save this? Why don't people click yes instead of keeping them in their heads? I suppose it's easy to keep them in your head when you use the same credentials <laughs> for every site. And so that is, that is a worrying statistic, I think. And I'm sure that is a, a kind of mirrored across the world. So ultimately, and what I'm trying to get across here is that your users of your applications are only as secure as their weakest password, as the weakest site out there that has their details, because uh, they will be compromised, they will be given up, and then they will be used in, in credential stuffing attacks against your applications. And it's sad. So what do we do about it? This is where we get to the two-factor authentication side of things and a whole bunch of other three-letter acronyms. Um, Two-factor authentication, 2FA, as we like to call it for short, uh, is, uh, and I like uh, an official definition of this, just to, to make it clear. Uh, Two-factor authentication is a security process in which a user provides two different forms of identification in order to authenticate themselves with a system. And those two forms must come from different categories. Normally something you know and something you have. And a, a very obvious kind of example of this is if you have a bank card, uh, so if you want to pay for something or bring or, or take money out of an ATM, uh, you need to provide the card and fill in the PIN number. So it's something you have and, and the PIN number is something you know. So that's two-factor authentication. There's a third category that sometimes uh, people um, pick, uh, which is, um, I forgot the word for this earlier as well, I can't remember it. Things like fingerprints, iris scans, facial recognition, that kind of thing. Um, but I uh, actually don't, um, think that's a good idea for online authentication uh, because you can't uh, it, a, a fingerprint and a facial recognition scan and an iris scan is not something you can go and change when it gets leaked uh, only earlier this year there was a security firm in the UK that leaked a million people's uh, fingerprints and facial recognition scans and you can't just go change your go rotate your fingerprints around <laughs> so um, uh, Biometrics, that's the word, ha. Biometrics um, are useful to show that this is who you are, but not great to actually prove authentication that you can get access to something. So uh, something you know and something you have are the keys here. And so we have three ways uh, available kind of to us as developers to approach this. Uh, SMS, uh, tokens, and push notifications. Uh, push authentication, which I'll get to at the end. We'll start with SMS though, because it is kind of a, uh, a, a universal thing almost. And you can implement it fairly simply, really. Uh, this might, is probably not the best way and I wouldn't recommend doing this, but you could just create a random six digit number, save that number to your user, uh, and then text them that number using whatever service uh, you want to. This is example with Twilio uh, to send a, send a text message just saying this is your login code. And then later we check that code against the, the, the code we saved earlier, right here. Um, that way we can, uh, uh, and, and right, this is the very simplest possible version of this. You probably would have a number of codes, you'd be able to um, uh, cancel them, turn them off, uh, remove it once it's done. But that's two-factor authentication with SMS. And it has some pros. I think it's a brilliant thing because almost everyone in the world, if they have a phone in their pocket, they can probably receive a text message and increase their account security. But there are some cons against it as well. Like text messages are gonna cost per message if you use an API service. Um, and so security of your users is going to cost you. Uh, it also on the part of the users requires signal. Um, on a number of occasions, I know I've been working in basements, gone to log into something and it's been like, I sent you a text. And I, like, oh, I have to go upstairs to log in now. <laughs> Um, or if you're on a plane with Wi-Fi, you suddenly can't log in because you can't get your text message. And finally, and probably most importantly, SMS is just plain broken. Uh, it's, um, let me tell you, let me tell you the horrifying reality of SMS security. So it all boils down to uh, uh, two things, two possible things that can go wrong. Firstly, social engineering. Sure, you have that uh, phone in your pocket right now and it has a SIM card in it and that SIM is attached to a phone number that a telecoms company somewhere uh, believes points at your phone. But, uh, and this has happened on more than one occasion, it's entirely possible for somebody to call up your telecoms operator and say, hey, I'm 
full and I, I need to port my SIM to a, a new, new network, new phone. I lost my SIM card, something like that. And, uh, and with enough practice and skill at social engineering, uh, it's possible to then get that company to port your number away. This happened, uh, I think one of the biggest things this happened to was um, Duray Mackerson, who is, uh, is a, uh, he was one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. Um, lost his access to his Twitter account because uh, a group of people social engineered his number away and, uh, and ported his SIM away and allowed them uh, and were able to reset his Twitter password um, using just the phone number. I want to note actually on that point that if you can access account with just one factor, like he had two factor authentication turned on and then was able to reset his password with his second factor. Uh, that's not two-factor authentication at that point, that's still just one. Sure, it's the slightly harder one, but it's just one. Um, so losing access to an account like that is, is entirely possible with SIM swapping attacks. And the second one are these three characters, SS7. SS7, uh, you don't know, probably don't know about, but it is the underpinnings of how all the telecoms operators uh, pass messages between themselves. Uh, it stands for signaling service number seven, uh, it came after the previous six and was, uh, was finalized in the, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and what's interesting about the early 1980s was everybody who was a telecoms operator was either a big telco or a government. And so there was a level of implicit trust in that system such that they decided they didn't need authentication. Everybody knew who, was, who else was in this network. And it was incredibly expensive and difficult to set up anything that would look like a telco. So this wasn't a problem we knew all of the actors in the system. But 30 years later, it's incredibly easy. It's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to set up something that at least looks like a telco and, um, and can and act like one. There's still no authentication on it. And so what happens is an attacker sets up one of these things and uh, joins the network and, uh, and then says, hey, this phone number is roaming. On, on me right now. So if you need to send a text message to this person, you got to pass it on to me and I'll deliver it to them. Uh, and so this can be used as a targeted attack to intercept people's text messages, which breaks their two-factor authentication. And this was used uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, my, the, the one I know about most, was used in Germany to break into a couple of uh, bank accounts um, by intercepting messages from Telefonica. Um, people lost money. People lost money about this. Uh, and so it is a targeted attack. It's a high value kind of proposition, but uh, it's, it's dangerous all the same. But I'm not trying to discourage you to necessarily stop using two-factor authentication over SMS because it is better than just a password. That's still a lot of work to do to break into somebody's account like that. The social engineering is difficult. The um, uh, uh, setting up a, a telco like operator to join the SS7 network is difficult. So two-factor authentication over SMS is still an entirely valid thing to do. It's better than just a password, but it's still the least secure version of uh, two-factor authentication, which is where we lead to tokens. Uh, and this is actually kind of, uh, this little part is the genesis uh, of why I wanted to give this talk, because I've always wondered um, how it all works and why um, so the token-based thing is where uh, you have an application on your phone and, uh, uh, and that application is generating a code and it normally changes once every 30 seconds or so. And I wanted to know how this worked. And so I ended up looking through and I read the RFCs for HOTP and TOTP. HOTP stands for HMAC-based one-time password and TOTP is time-based one-time password. And uh, right, this is what it looks like. Um, you might have this in, uh, this is on the right, on the, on the left. I know what I'm talking about. On the left uh, is the Authy application, on the right Google Authenticator. There they are both agreeing uh, with the same code, which is nice to see uh, as I took that screenshot at the same time. Um, and this is what it might look like, and this is how it works. Uh, this is how the RFC for HOTP uh, defines uh, what's going on. So it takes um, two uh, inputs, uh, a key and a counter. Um, and what we do is we take the HMAC digest of that key and counter, uh, we truncate it with a specific uh, algorithm that, is, um, that picks out 16 bytes in the middle of the uh, um, 30 or 40 bytes that the HMAC will give you. And then finally pass it through a positive bit mask to make sure it's a positive number. And then uh, after we get that number, 
uh, will mod uh, by 10 to the D, where D is the number of characters you want, so six, uh, mostly. And that's how you get it. Um, it's all entirely based on the fact that uh, that key and counter together are the only ways to create the number at the end. And there's no way to tell from a previous uh, array of those numbers what the next one can be. You need the key, you need the counter. And I want to show you this in action, so give me one second. Uh, let's go to over here. Oops. So I'm j oh, hello, is this one? Yes. Uh, so I'm just in a Python shell right here, and um, I'm going to import uh, PyOTP. PyOTP is a great uh, implementation of one-time passwords. Funnily enough, it's actually based on the Ruby implementation, uh, to the point that the um, repo was forked originally from the Ruby uh, implementation called ROTP, um, but it's now entirely written in Python, which makes more sense. Uh, and so we're going to create uh, an HOTP uh, using PyOTP, HOTP. And in here we pass it the secret. Um, this is a secret that we have to share between the uh, user and the application. Uh, it is uh, normally base32 encoded, uh, but I'm just going to use hello because I'm terrible at passwords, remember? Um, and so using that, we can uh, now add a counter. We'll start with zero and find out what our code is. And we get a completely different code when we go to one. And that makes sense. And on the other hand, on the other side of things, we can verify that code. Uh, so we'll verify the first one, 227647, uh, at that counter, so zero. And that's true, that's correct. Like it, it's, it's just making it up using the original code and, 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 sorry, using the original counter and connecting it. That makes sense. Uh, and so if we tried to verify the second one, 679646, six, using the first counter, we'd be wrong, false. Uh, but if we increase our counter, we're true. That's HOTP. Uh, it's great, except we actually have to, uh, if we were using this, we have to keep uh, uh, updated kind of where we are in that counter between the user and the site. So that's where TOTP comes into it, because it takes that counter out of the situation by replacing it with time. Uh, TOTP actually uses, um, you pick a window, normally you'll have seen this to be 30 seconds, and uh, uh, we um, take the, uh, we divide the time since the Unix epoch uh, by the, uh, by the, by 30 seconds, and, uh, and use that as the, um, the counter, effectively. So we don't have to worry about entering a counter when we do this. I'm just going to use hello again. Uh, and totp.now, oops, now, uh, will give us a code. And that code will be the same for a little while, and then it'll change. In fact, it changed straight away there. So I was right at the end of that 30 second window at the time. Uh, so now it's doing the same thing over and over again, and we'll do for the next 30 seconds. Uh, and instead we can verify. So we'll verify the existing one right now, 740480, and that should be true. But if we verify the old one, uh, 915414, uh, it's obviously false. It's not the one that's right now. However, that's not a great user experience. Um, and so what we should do is uh, allow a bit more of a window um, for people to enter those codes. So you don't want to get to the end of that 30 seconds in your app and you're panicking and rushing to get the number copied across. It probably doesn't matter because a good implementation of two-factor authentication will allow a window. And I think if I put the window one now, it's probably going to be false because I talked too long. But if we have it up to two, now the, uh, the, the window is valid for uh, two sessions and, uh, and we can verify that, note, that code and, uh, and, and allow our user to log in. And that's cool. So I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, I, uh, I recommend you check out... Um, check out this library. What's actually great about it is the uh, source code is really clear uh, and you can go in and see how this is all made up. Uh, and so I kind of recommend having a read through that just to, uh, it takes you from um, that, uh, which is a little more abstract, to the real code, which makes a lot more sense. Um, so I'd read that. And then if you are looking to implement this in something like a Django site, uh, Django OTP is a, is a top tool for that. I'm not going to show any details of that uh, here because it involves um, uh, involves a lot of just configuration, basically, along with the rest of your um, Django authentication. But that's generating our tokens, that's generating our codes. Um, the other side of this is that we have to share that secret. I was using a terrible secret of hello, but I still have to get that into the user's phone somehow. And this is where we get uh, the one and only use for QR codes in the world. Uh, <laughs> well, the best use of QR codes, maybe. Um, you see, this was actually... Uh, 
the, uh, uh, OTP, um, so our passwords here, have a scheme of URL that we can now use. Um, OTP auth is a scheme. And then uh, if you create a URL using a type, uh, a label, and some parameters, uh, including that secret, we can share that. And this is what gets turned into a QR code. So the type in this is HOTP or TOTP, depending on which one you're using. Uh, the label is what your application is called. Uh, and then the parameters will have to include a parameter called secret. And uh, it's good to include a parameter called issuer as well, uh, which uh, is more a description of your application. So this is sort of a very small example, but as you can see, um, we have, oops, where's it gone? Uh, TOTP there is a type. Uh, I've labeled uh, this particular one 2FAWTF. Um, I've labeled it 2FAWTF and my user account. Uh, and this is useful because if, you, uh, uh, if people have more than one account in your system, uh, this will uh, differentiate that uh, inside the authenticator application. Uh, and then we add the secret right here and the issuer again, the application. So I can show that off in my code as well. So if I go back here, uh, I import, I'm going to import a little tool I wrote which just turns, um, uh, turns the URL into a QR code. And we can take our TOTP from earlier and create a provisioning URI for it using the issuer, which uh, uh, this is the label name, in fact, so 2FA WTF and Nash at twilio.com. Doesn't matter, this is just a label. Um, and we can pass, uh, so the TOTP object here already has our secret involved in it, um, but I'm also gonna pass the issuer name, which as I said earlier was just the application name, uh, which I'll call 2FAWTF right now. And that creates us a, a, the, the, the URL, and then I can turn that into a, um, uh, your, uh, into a, no, I'm not online, of course. Oh, that was silly. We'll, we'll forget that. <laughs> I couldn't find the Wi-Fi down this end of the thing, uh, but that would have created a QR code, uh, which we would have been able to uh, then use in an authenticator application and all agree uh, on what the uh, code was at the time. Uh, if you don't trust me about that, come find me afterwards and I will show you back up in the Wi-Fi section. Um, so there's pros and cons to these tokens as well, much like SMS. Uh, the pros are that if you implement it yourself like this, uh, it can be free uh, and it works offline. Like once the uh, application has uh, shared that secret across uh, from the, from once the web application has shared the secret across to your authenticator application, it doesn't need anything else to generate those codes. Uh, so it works offline. There are cons of course, it requires your users to have a smartphone and that's not necessarily the case for everybody in the world. Um, account recovery becomes a little bit difficult. Um, so this tends to involve creating a bunch of backup codes, uh, which people can use and they have to copy and save and ultimately just become another password because they're just things, you know, um, and then, uh, QR codes can be intercepted as well. This one seems unlikely, but if somebody's signing up for a, a, a site in the, uh, in a, in a cafe or, or somewhere, they can be spied on. Um, I feel it's a little bit weird that, um, that you're kind of just putting that secret out into the world for people to look at. So we get to push the, uh, the most secure and most exciting of the two factor vindications. Uh, and I'll tell you why it is. Um, it is the most secure. And what happens here is instead of, uh, just, um, uh, instead of uh, passing a token back and forth between people, uh, this uses uh, an encrypted channel to send the details of what's happening, uh, down to an, uh, an application. Uh, at which point the user can then accept or deny that, uh, and that tells the application whether they're happy. So this is just an example of that. Uh, if I go and sign into this fake owl bank here and go and log in, it's going to send a push notification to my device saying, Hey, you're trying to log in to this bank. And if we go and look at that, uh, it's going to, it's going to tell me the details. Uh, and if I just pause it there for a second, uh, we can see that we've actually sent the details down. Um, and there's things like, uh, the message here that's saying, hey, we're trying to log into our bank. And we can use this for transactions as well. So if you were trying to send money to somebody uh, and the thing came down saying, hey, you're trying to send $10,000 to somebody you don't know, you'd be like, hey, I might deny that. Um, and this is where the user um, experience side of it comes in because if you press approve, that means the application gets notified that you said yes and can move straight on. 
There's no copying codes back and forth for people. There's no typing in a thing. There's no waiting for a 30 seconds countdown to happen. Uh, you press approve and you're through. The, the uh, pros for this, of course, is a much better experience. It's very rare, I think, that better security can also come with a better user experience, uh, especially because this, this is the most secure version of this. The cons are, of course, it requires a smartphone on your user's part. It requires them to have downloaded and installed a native application. Um, there's more work on your, web on your web application to do because um, at least the way that we've implemented this at, at Twilio is that uh, once that user presses approve, um, your application gets a webhook to say that happened and then you have to do something that's gonna move that page on and agree that the user is now authenticated. And again, it doesn't work on offline because you need, that, uh, you need the connection so that you can get that push notification sent through. Although interestingly enough, it, it's slightly better than SMS in this case because you don't need a cell connection, you just need Wi-Fi. Um, so you can use it on a plane, for example, if your plane has Wi-Fi. Um, if you're interested in how you would implement two-factor authentication using push uh, and, and the Authy API, which we have at Twilio, uh, then uh, we have two uh, articles, um, uh, two tutorials there that, you, uh, that will take you through that for both Flask and Django, if that's of interest to you. Uh, and I will publish these slides with the links uh, later as well, so if, if that uh, does uh, take your fancy, uh, just to find out how that works, uh, do have a look. And then uh, I, I found this, I love this joke on, on Twitter, uh, to improve security, we're next rolling out X-Factor authentication, and on your next login, you'll need to record a personal authentication song. Now, this actually was a joke from 2015, um, but I'm excited to see a talk uh, by uh, my friend Ben DeCry of AuthZero later on this year, who is going to be talking about using voice as uh, an authentication method. And so we're getting there. Maybe you don't have to sing, but... Uh, if you ever are asked to do an authentication method via voice, I recommend trying to sing it. Um, so that's kind of our two-factor authentication story. Um, in summary, users are bad with passwords. I'm a terrible person with passwords. I'm better now. But other users are, and some of us have also admitted to being bad with it. So users are bad with passwords. But other websites are bad with those passwords too. They are getting leaked out into the, uh, onto the web all over the place every single day, every single week. So even if your users, uh, even if you are the most secure site in the world, other websites are just leaking your user credentials and they've probably reused them. Two-factor authentication can be uh, push, token, or SMS. And actually, I uh, like to think of this as a, a hierarchy. It's not necessarily a, um, a, an either-or situation, but more of a, like, a, a way of falling back. Uh, I've done a lot of work as a front-end developer and it seems to me like a progressive enhancement of things as well. And so implement SMS because it works for everybody, uh, or it will work for 99.9% .9 of people and make them more secure. Uh, but to make it better, implement token and implement push support to make it the best experience it can be. And that way we can give uh, that better security to everybody, um, regardless of kind of their, their technology in their pocket. And so two-factor authentication ultimately is for your users. Um, it's keeping their accounts safe it's keeping uh, their peace of mind as well. It's keeping them safe on this guy. <laughs> I, 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 he's won here, obviously, because he's, I, I think he's stolen the lock out of the URL bar from your HTTPS or something. I, I don't know what's happening here. He's the one to, to, to bring. So hopefully that has a uh, turn from you uh, for 2FA from WTF into 2FA for the win. Uh, I want to see you all go out and implement this and make your users more secure and more safe. And uh, that is all I have. So thank you very much for joining this afternoon. Thank you.